Hi, and welcome to our webinar. My name is John Hunter, Senior Manager of Content at Cvent. A little bit about myself. I've been in marketing at Cvent for about 12 years, and my wife has been in the events industry for 10 years, actually make that 20 years, time flies. So it's basically a family passion, you might say. I'm going to be your host today, alongside my colleague, industry expert, Kirsten Sargent. Hey guys, uh, we're so excited to be here and talk to you guys today about what an attendee wants. I've been at Cvent for two years now. I'm actually coming up on my two year anniversary next week. Congratulations. Um, I know, it's very exciting. Um, before that, I was uh, still in the events industry for about the last 10 years um, in associations and other corporate companies. I even did wedding planning for a little while. So dabble a little bit, but uh, yeah, we're excited to be here. And uh, without further ado, we would like to introduce Robert Plant, who will be joining us today, adorning our set, making it look a little bit brighter for you. Uh, so I hope you enjoy, Robert. Thank you for being here. Um, but let's start it off. We have a lot of great content to cover today. Uh, before we get into things, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. Um, as you noticed, if you're logged in on the right side of your screen, you'll find the chat and Q&A. We would actually love to hear your questions and comments throughout this entire webinar. Uh, you'll also be able to upvote your favorite questions within the Q&A section, and we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Um, to download this slide deck and our other documents, you can click Resources on the right. All right, I think it's time we're going to just dig in. All right, so we're really excited to share this with you as we have a large, rather diverse group of respondents. As you can see here, there's a nice global mix. There's about a thousand plus respondents from all over the world, North America, Europe, APAC are all represented here. Uh, we also have a, a variety of folks who, you know, have different planning, uh, you know, uh, abilities here. We have people who just hold one event or two events or three events or more. So really good group of people. Um, so a little bit about the research that we learned from Hanover. Um, as you can see on your screen here, Professional development at 53% and networking are the main drivers of event attendance. And attendees favor events closer to home, and they're more likely to get approval for those events in the same city. Big number there, 69% or state. And as, as, you, as uh, you know, we put a lot of work into our event websites here. So event websites are the dominant way to register for an event, and they're used post-event as well. Uh, no surprise here about food and catering. They are expected at events. 69% of folks want those. And the quality of speakers and activities is key to event satisfaction. Speakers, very important. Um, now, how do attendees consider event success? Uh, it's measured by new skills learned, 57%, and a better understanding of the latest advancements in the industry. Okay, I think it's time to dig in, Kirsten. Sounds great. Um, so we're looking at the screen here as the unmet needs. So we're gonna dig in to a little bit about the why behind these unmet needs. As you can see, we got about six of these. Uh, let's just ring them off. Affordable events and travel costs. We know budgetary concerns are huge. Pre-event communications, scheduling and timing, networking evolution might be my favorite. This is really cool. The rise of personalization and extending event impact. Now, uh, as we move to the first topic, affordable events and travel costs. Right here, 61% of organizations budget roughly between 500 and 2,500 for an event emphasizing the need for cost-effective planning, right? So Kirsten, I think uh, the first question for you today is, why is budgeting becoming a more significant challenge in driving event attendance and ensuring your desired audience you know, can actually show up to your events? Yeah, so I think this is very important. So budgeting is becoming a more significant challenge for several reasons. So the first one is those rising costs. So mm. the cost associated with everything is going up. Just look at your groceries, gas, everything is expensive. So all the costs that go into organizing your events from the venue rental, food and beverage, AV, staffing, literally every aspect has been increasing over time. 
This makes it more challenging to allocate a sufficient budget for all the aspects of the event while keeping it affordable for the audience. It's such a really delicate balance that we have to make. Second is the change in that audience expectation. So today's audiences have higher expectations when it comes to event experiences. They expect more value for their money and they want events that offer unique and memorable experiences. You can't just put on a basic event anymore. You have to incorporate fun activations, really make attendees want to show up. However, meeting these expectations requires additional investments in areas like AV, entertainment, which can put even more of a strain on the event budget. So this is also where your buy-in from stakeholders and sponsors really comes in. If you can get them on board with these new initiatives, this will really help immensely. So try adding in sponsored activations as an option in your prospectus. We've had a ton of interest in this. Um, then we have accessibility barriers. So budget constraints can also impact the accessibility of events. Um, when those ticket prices are high, certain demographics may be excluded due to financial limitations. This can result in a less diverse and inclusive audience, limiting the overall reach and impact of that event. So maybe instead of focusing solely on one large event, like we spoke about a few minutes ago, you can explore the potential of your smaller, more local events. These can be more cost effective and attract attendees who may have those limitations in terms of travel or budget. Those smaller events also provide an opportunity for more intimate and engaging experiences. For example, we hosted our first executive wine event in Q4 of last year, and that was a smaller, more intimate event, and it went over really well. I mean, who doesn't love some free wine? I, I know, love free wine. I know we both do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to overcome these challenges, event organizers must carefully plan and allocate their budget prioritize those essential elements and really find creative solutions to offer an engaging experience while keeping the costs manageable for all of those attendees. So effective marketing strategies, sponsorship opportunities, and partnerships are really key in helping to offset some of those costs. All right, great, thank you. Um, so let's move on to free pre-event comms. So th this one was kind of a surprise to me. And as I reveal the slide, you'll see 38% uh, want more information about event activities prior to attending. So as a marketer, I always worry about over communicating and sending too many emails and just bugging people before the <laughs> events like, hey, you registered. Here's about a thousand more messages about what's going on. But we feel like we understand from this research there's a thirst for that. Right. Mm -hmm. So what advice can you offer around getting more info out to attendees pre event? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a great question. So to be honest, TikTok has really been a driver in our pre-event mm. comms these days. So we have a great event marketing team here at Cvent. So shout out to Dara uh, that will see a new TikTok trend and then reach out to us on the planning team to film a fun video that we'll use to promote our events. I don't want to give anything away, but be on the lookout for some fun videos we have planned leading up to this year's Cvent Connect in San Antonio. We just went on our site visit last week and we filmed mm. some really fun videos. So be on the lookout for that. Also, it helps that we have some Gen Zers around. They really keep those comms fun and hip, <laughs> as they say. Um, also, I think this is, like you said, a hot take, but I almost think that you should over communicate when it comes to those pre-event comms. The more comms, the merrier. As a fellow event planner, I have that type A personality where I like to know every aspect of an event before I'm on site. I appreciate when event almost over communicates. I'm also that way when I travel and in my everyday life. So sorry to my husband for that type A personality. And I also think it helps building the buzz, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you just want that momentum heading up to your event, you know, whether you're adding a speaker or, or a cool session mm -hmm. or you have some kind of nighttime activity planned, right? Definitely. All right, cool. Now, speaking of activities and timing, let's move <laughs> on to our next topic, scheduling and timing. This is a pain point for many attendees because they feel like, you know, maybe it's a little too crammed up of a schedule and they're not getting to see or attend everything they want to attend. So let's take a look at this data point. 30% of attendees report activities taking too long and overlapping. Oh, that's a nightmare. <laughs> so, so here's a tough one for you. All right. How do you make sure people are getting to all the things that matter the most to them and so they don't have to make a big sacrifice during their day. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So 
Um, I think you have to really look at the pandemic. So pandemic has really accelerated the adoption of these hybrid event formats. So by offering those online components alongside with your in-person experiences, organizers can cater to individuals who may have the limitations like we talked about earlier, such as travel constraints, those health concerns, or the financial barriers. This really enables attendees to access the content and experiences that matter most to them from the comfort of their own location. Then we have the flexible scheduling. I'm gonna talk about how this relates particularly to our Cvent Connect planning. I think it's very important that event planners can offer flexible scheduling options. This would include those staggered sessions, multiple time slots, or even on-demand access to recorded content, just like you're gonna have with this webinar. So by allowing attendees to choose when and how they engage with the event, organizers can ensure that individuals can prioritize the aspects that really matter to most of them without conflicting with their other commitments. We all know when attendees come on site to your event, they're wanting to get something out of attending, but also you have to remember they have their own nine to five-ish jobs that they're working while there. You all know we work way more than nine to five. But by adding in more time in between those sessions to allow attendees to step away for a call, answer an email, offering a working space on site and making, a session, making the sessions overall shorter, these are all a nice touch to allow attendees a little bit of flexibility. Lastly, um, I think providing options for personalization and customization can help attendees really tailor their experience to their specific interests and priorities. Uh, this can involve offering different tracks or sessions that cater to different areas of interest, as well as those different career levels, allowing your attendees to curate their own agenda. So by providing a variety of choices, individuals can ensure they focus on the aspects of the event that really matter to them the most. If I'm a seasoned event planner, I don't necessarily need to attend a session on event planning one-on-one. -on -one. So I love when agendas can be filtered out and I can attend something more focused to my skill set or more advanced. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, everybody in the events business can agree that we should just retire the nine to five phrase. Yes, we that should. was a great song. <laughs> we love you, Dolly, but yep. it does not apply Agreed. to people in our industry. Agreed. Okay, moving on. Networking evolution. I kind of earmarked this one because I thought this was really cool. Uh, let's take a look at this. So 70 or excuse me, 67 percent said networking opportunities are important when considering event attendance, but networking has changed. We've undergone a seismic shift in networking. So Kirsten, why are older traditional networking methods no longer really working at events in 2024? Yeah, so I think 67% is a low um, percentage in my opinion. Um, so I think in today's fast paced interconnected world, people expect networking experience that are going beyond those tr traditional methods. So merely exchanging business cards or engaging in small talk at a bar at an event is really no longer seen as effective or meaningful. Mm. Um, I mean, just last week I was at an event, grabbed business cards and came home and did laundry and accidentally left them in my pockets. Oh no. Needless to say, I don't have those anymore, <laughs> and I know that we've all been there, so let's not do paper business cards anymore. But <laughs> attendees now seek more engaging and valuable interactions that can lead to those meaningful connections and opportunities. So your traditional methods often lack that interactivity, making it challenging for participants to truly engage and connect with others. In contrast, the more modern network networking expectations really emphasize the importance of interactive experiences that foster genuine conversations, the knowledge sharing and collaborations that we all know that the attendees want. Mm -hmm. So attendees want to actively participate, share their insights and learn from others in a more dynamic and engaging manner. So also want to look at this through an inclusivity lens. So attendees don't always want to interact with one another via a happy hour while drinking alcohol. We've actually seen this in the survey results, especially over the last two years that really emphasize the want for something different. So I think it's really important to think outside the box when planning your networking methods and offer different, more exciting, more inclusive options. So I've seen a lot of fun things recently at those happy hours, um, like some tarot card readings. I saw a pickleball tournament a couple weeks ago. Mm. Um, we got those AI characters. Um, honestly, I also find it helpful to think about what you would want to do with friends and family outside of work when you're planning these events and see how you could work that into a networking event. So, for example, if you think about those foodies, if you have a paella making workshop or a wine blending class, 
Um, then you have those athletes out there. You could do one of the fun runs or yoga, maybe even add in some animals like a goat yoga or kitten yoga. For those outdoorsy people, you could do a scavenger hunt or a walking tour, maybe even combine with the foodies and do a walking food tour. So I think it's a fun and exciting time for us as event planners to really think outside the box. You know, you got me, you had me on goat yoga. <laughs> I, I think I might have to ask you more about that because I was looking at the chat and people are sending in questions. Thank you very much. And one of them was about fun networking ideas and, and the goat yoga. Oh, you wrote yeah. me in on the goat yoga. I want to know more about the goat yoga. <laughs> okay, so now uh, we're moving on to the rise of personalization. Um, so personalized experience or experiences attendees would like to have access to, like this has changed as well, right? This is more than adding someone's first name on a subject line in an email. It's like crafting event experiences for individuals. Yeah. So what's driving this increasing demand, Kirsten, uh, for these personalized event experiences, do you think? Yeah, so I think this is definitely my favorite question so far that we've asked because I love this idea of the personalized event experiences. Uh, in my day-to-day -day job, I'm constantly asked how we can up-level and personalize each event. And I just love creating ways to make this happen. So I think first, you have to start with the attendee preferences. Uh, so the rise of the digital technology has transformed our expectations for these personalized experiences. So with availability of data analytics, planners can gather insights about attendees' preferences, behavior, and interests in the beginning of the planning process. And this enables them to tailor the event experience to those individual needs, delivering relevant content, recommendations, and the networking opportunities that they actually wanna take part in. So attendees now expect these more personalized and customized experiences, and being armed with this hard data at the beginning can really help guide the discussions. I think personalization also creates a sense of exclusivity and enhances the overall attendee experience, leading to that increased retention and word of mouth promotion, which we both know is very important. Mm -hmm. So you really wanna foster a sense of that emotional connection and loyalty. And I think this is the best way to do this. So as I mentioned earlier, we need to give attendees a reason to miss work to attend our events. So by really tailoring something to them, this gives them a reason why. Um, plus, as other planners raise the bar for these customized experiences, we all now must meet these heightened expectations to remain competitive and relevant. If you aren't creating anything custom, I think you should just jump on that bandwagon soon. Again, think outside the box. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This uh, diverse learning styles is one I was going to ask you about, too. Yes. Um, so definitely want to touch on that. So accommodating those various learning styles has become crucial at events due to the growing recognition of those different learning preferences and the need for inclusive educational methods. This goes back to our inclusivity and the recognition stems from understanding that individuals have unique ways of processing information and really engaging with learning materials. So people have different learning styles. You have visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or a combination thereof. So by really catering to these preferences, planners can ensure that attendees can absorb and retain information more effectively. So by accommodating these various learning styles, it really promotes inclusivity, ensuring that all attendees can fully participate and really benefit, especially from those educational sessions. So by offering a range of learning methods and formats, planners can create opportunities for attendees to really engage with the content in ways that resonate with their individual learning preferences. I think this really fosters an environment where everyone feels valued and included, which is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, then as we move into the session type, so um, to accommodate for all the different learning styles, you should really try to strike a balance between all your different session types you, for your keynotes, panel discussions, workshops, educational sessions. Uh, I mean, those keynotes and can panel discussions provide those valuable insights and inspiration, while those workshops and educational se sessions are really gonna offer that hands-on learning experience and then the practical application of the knowledge. Um, by offering a diverse range of these session types, you can really cater to most learning styles and ensure that attendees can apply what they learned right away. Um, when you incorporate these practical exercises, the case studies, the real life examples into these workshops, and educational sessions, you can really make sure they're applying that. So this helps attendees connect theory with practice and provides them with tangible takeaways that can immediately apply in their personal and professional lives. 
Also, providing post-event resources such as presentation materials, take-home books can further support that ongoing learning and application of knowledge. Um, I also want to touch on inclusivity and accessibility as well. So I think it's really important that when we're talking about personalizing those experiences, that we also talk about pushing accessibility to the forefront of event planning. Because you know, 26% of attendees face accessibility challenges. So how can we create an experience personalized to those unique needs? So first we have to have social awareness. There have been a significant shift in societal attitudes towards inclusivity and accessibility. People are becoming more conscious of the importance of creating environments that are welcoming and accommodating for individuals of all backgrounds and abilities. This heightened awareness has led to a demand for events that are inclusive and accessible, reflecting the values of diversity and quality. One large example of how we try to incorporate this is through Cvent Connect. We try to put this lens on every portion of the event, from having closed captioning, to quiet rooms, to prayer rooms, to gender neutral restrooms. Really, every aspect of an event needs to be included in this type of planning. Another aspect is the legal requirements. So many countries have implemented laws and regulations that emphasize the need for inclusivity and accessibility in these public places, including events. So these laws ensure that individuals with disabilities have equal access to participate in events and enjoy all the amenities and services offered. Event planners are now required to comply with these accessibility standards, such as providing wheelchair ramps, accessible restrooms, assisted technologies, to really ensure that everyone can fully engage in every event experience. Every country is different in their requirements, so it's important to look at that when planning in other countries. Uh, then going back to what I touched on earlier is the business benefits. So organizers have recognized the business benefit of prioritizing inclusivity and accessibility. So by making these events more accessible to a wider audience, they can tap into new markets and attract a more diverse attendee base. This not only enhances the reputation and brand image of the event and the company as a whole, but also increases the potential for higher attendance and revenue generation. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, is creating a po positive attendee experience, a drive in creating more inclusive and accessible events. So by removing these barriers and accommodating diverse needs, event planners can create an environment where everyone feels valued and included this is going to lead to increased attendee satisfaction, engagement, and a higher likelihood of repeat attendance. Event planners understand the importance of creating an environment that respects the dignity and rights of every individual. And by really prioritizing inclusivity and accessibility, event organizers can foster a sense of belonging and create memorable experience for all of our attendees. Ooh. Yeah. Take a breath. Big topic. Big yeah, topic. that was a huge topic. I yeah. love it though. There's a lot of great so I stuff. I said it was in my there. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Oh, so we got we have another one here. Um, we're going to move on to extending the events impact. This is super important, and there's a lot of ways that we can do that uh, in 2024. But as I click over to our graph, 59% of attendees expect to receive information about future events, emphasizing the importance of post-event engagement. And you, as you can see on your screen, 57% of these attendees desire summary information based on activities they actually attended. So Kirsten, I'm, I'm going to try to vamp a little bit to give you another breath. <laughs> why, why is post-event engagement becoming so increasingly important? And what strategies can you uh, pass along that can extend the impact of, of these ever so critical events? Yeah, so I think this question is kind of a two-parter. You've got the learning aspect, and then you've got the networking aspect. So first off, post-event post engagement allows attendees to continue their learning journey beyond the event itself. It provides an opportunity to really reflect on the knowledge that they gained, revisit those session materials like you can do today, and then delve deeper into the topics that are covered. So for example, by providing recordings of sessions they attended, and the corresponding materials. This ensures that attendees can fully utilize what they have learned and apply it in their personal professional lives at their leisure. Um, secondly, events often provide valuable networking opportunities and post-event engagement allows attendees to maintain and strengthen the relationships formed during the event. This can involve following up with new connections, engaging in online communities, or participating in post-event networking events or even something unplanned like a coffee chat or a Zoom meeting follow-up. 
I love attending an event and making new connections at some yoga event, maybe goat yoga or morning 5K. Goat yoga, goat <laughs> yoga. <laughs> yes, I'm that crazy person that likes to work out while they're on site. But then afterwards, connecting virtually over coffee or chatting about the next industry event we may both attend is just exciting. So by nurturing these relationships, attendees can expand their professional networks and foster collaborations beyond the event. In our world of social media and LinkedIn, I think it's easier than ever. And also, in my opinion, I think the most important. I think if you're advertising the post-event recordings and uh, make a connection during the event, these are strategies that can expand the impact of the event even after it's ended. Okay, great. Um, so I know that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we're cooking with fire, as we say here at C-Event. Um, uh, I know we talked a lot about today about the evolving needs based on the Hanover research and we ran through it super fast, but I hope, you know, everybody here found it useful and informative. And, you know, the good news is we're going to be releasing this entire Hanover report soon. So keep an eye out for that on cvent.com and your socials. We'll be out there uh, advertising this. Additionally, this recording will be available on demand for you to watch again at your leisure. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to earn a hundred dollar gift card, please sign up for a demo with us. We'll pop the link into the chat. And to any recipient outside of the US, the gift card can be converted from $100 USD to another currency available of your choosing. Now, the exciting part for me is we got a lot of questions. All right. A lot of really good questions. Let's so do it. frying pan into the fire for you, <laughs> Kirsten. Um, all right. So there's some really cool ones uh, I think we touched on, but I think I want to start with this one because I found it particularly um, interesting. Okay. How can you make experiences super personalized well without having to ask attendees endless questions when they register? Oh, that's a great question. Curveball. I know, right? First one <laughs> off the bat. So I think that's kind of a multi-parter. So I think it depends on the type of demographic that you're catering your event to. So I think you can make some educated guesses as to some of those personalized experiences um, just by surely knowing who your or who your attendees are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think even if you do have to ask those questions throughout registration, yes, I agree, you shouldn't ask a ton of them, but um, just kind of knowing what your attendees want, um, I think is overall great. And if you have to ask a question or two, I don't think it's going to like hinder your attendance at all if they have to answer that extra question, because they know that that's why you're asking it because you want to be able to cater the experience towards them and maybe even put a note in registration that, hey, we want to ask you questions so that we can really cater your experience, really personalize experience for you. Um, and then I think they're going to be more inclined to answer the questions. Okay. All right. So here's the next one. All right. Now, this, this is good. This is, a, this is kind of about timing. This is a timing question. Okay. How long after an event ends should we send the summary info? Ooh, great question. I mm. think as soon as possible. I think as soon as you have everything ready to go, you should send it. You should really focus on that post-event momentum and really keep it going. The longer that you wait to send things out, the more your lives are going to happen. People are going to go about their daily lives, get back into their work schedule, and your event is going to be but a mere memory. Um, so I think the sooner the better that you can get that out and really focus on that is great. Very good. Very good. Oh, said so this is a good one. I've not, I've not even actually heard of this before, so I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask this to you right now. Ooh. Yeah, does the speed networking, like speed dating approach, work at conferences and trade shows? I know at CBAN Connect we have a huge trade show. We do. We so, do. so does this work? I would say in the trade show aspect, it does. Um, I personally have never had a good experience with it as an overall just networking opportunity where you kind of set it up like speed dating. I think it has the connotation that it's more like a speed dating and people are like, oh, I don't have the personality to do this. Um, we have to be a little bit more outgoing to participate. Mm -hmm. However, in our trade show, um, and I think in a trade show environment, it does work well. So we have appointment scheduling where people can schedule appointments and it's just like quick little blurbs. You know what you're there to talk about. You can submit your RFP beforehand so you know what you're going to be talking about. So mm -hmm. I say yes and no. I feel like in the trade show aspect, it works in a networking one, 
maybe not so much. Uh, okay. But if anybody's have a great experience with that in the past, please put it in the chat. Yeah, I'm sure everyone would love to hear. Yeah, exactly. So this is a good one because I, I know that um, uh, you know the, the the great thing about event professionals is you know we're we we are we're all over different generations. You mentioned TikTok earlier. Mm -hmm. You know. I'm not on TikTok. Uh, I, I use uh, Instagram sparingly. Um, so the question, <laughs> the question here is, what is the demographic for which the TikTok comms approach works best? I'm 60 and would not expect my event information to come from TikTok. So how do you think, without giving anything away, I know yeah. that we have surprises, but how do you leverage TikTok? Because we have Gen Z attendees, we have millennial attendees, mm -hmm. we have Gen X attendees, and we have boomer attendees at this point. Yeah. So I think you're definitely going to get a wide range of demographics there. So um, like John just mentioned, he's not on TikTok. I'm actually not either. So anytime our team sends us over something, I'm like, what is this trend? Let me look into it. Um, however, my parents are, you know, I don't want to say their age on camera here, but um, <laughs> they're in the older generation. And one of them is on TikTok and does know some of these trends. So mm. I think you're going to get it all over the spectrum. And a lot of these videos, you don't have to necessarily know that it's a TikTok trend to know like and think it's mm -hmm. entertaining. Um, it's created a lot of good buzz and a lot of good feedback since we started doing it. So I think it's worth a try. Um, you know, if it doesn't work for you, that's great. But like I said, we've seen great results from it all mm -hmm. over the spectrum and all demographics for all ages. Yeah, that's cool. And, and, and you also pointed out to me before we started recording that um, sometimes these TikToks end up on Instagram yeah, or they exactly. end up on Twitter. Yep. Like you can share these things through all these different platforms. So, yep. you know, that, that's, that might be the best way to get kind of the buzz out there for an event, you know, yeah, you definitely. Can work with your social media team, or if you don't have one, then, you know, work the best way you can to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, like you said, we also post ours on LinkedIn too. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Instagram, so you kind of get all the social media, you know, if somebody isn't on social media at all, it might go over their head a little bit, right. but um, I'd say from a general speaking that most people are either on LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, one of the four, or even Twitter. Terrific. Yeah. All right, so uh, we have, we just got, we got a good time here, so I got plenty of really good questions. So now, um, so as you know, when you mentioned it, I was now I've become obsessed with goat yoga. <laughs> so, so the the question is, well, wait a second, where, how do you even get a goat <laughs> to come to your? All right, never mind. I'll let you answer this question okay. first. So, what do you? What are some examples of fun networking ideas that maybe you didn't mention there? I know that there's. There are probably a few out there maybe you haven't tried yet or you heard of. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll focus on the goat yoga for a second. <laughs> so Please. you can rent animals for that. So oh. fun fact, um, they also do ones with um, like dogs and cats and they're available for adoption. Um, we actually did one um, at a trade show where we had um, like a dog petting area and they were available for adoption. So um, for those type of scenarios, you can typically reach out to your local um, like SPCA mm -hmm. or um, animal, animal welfare group, um, and they'll be able to help you with that. But for something more niche, like a goat yoga, um, there are actually places that you can rent them from. Um, they've got those, llamas, bunnies, like, so you could really do anything that you oh, want nice. just to really up level the yoga experience if you want. But if you don't want to provide the animals with that extra little bit liability insurance there, um, mm -hmm. you could also incorporate um, like wine with that. I attended one where you did like a wine pairing with it, which was great. Um, and Wines then, and goats? Yeah, wine and goats, yeah. <laughs> How perfect is that evening? Right? Wines I mean, and... <laughs> you, you, you check all the boxes. You get yoga, you get wine, you get goats. Yeah, like, there you go. What yoga, else do you wine, need? and goats. I think that's the best one. Yeah. Um, so like I mentioned before, I try to think about it, what I would want to do mm -hmm. with my friends or my family when I'm thinking about a networking opportunity. So um, as I mentioned earlier, those cooking workshops have been um, pretty well received. So I personally am not a great cook. Um, so something like that is kind of fun um, where you can learn how to cook. It's a really good networking opportunity. You're talking with, mm -hmm. you know, your people while you're making something, um, which is great. I think we've all seen like the 5k walk and runs that they do like in the mm -hmm. mornings or the evenings. 
Um, you could maybe combine that if you wanted to do like a food or drink aspect where you can contact local businesses along your route and you can just do little stops there, um, kind of like a little crawl, if you will, mm -hmm. um, incorporating the food and beverage aspect of it too. So I think really the, the world is your oyster. It's really whatever, if you think about something that you like to do, mm -hmm. chances are there's someone else that would also like to do it. I mean, like I said, I saw pickleball tournament a couple of weeks ago. So that's such a random niche thing, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking some event planner that was planning that probably said, you know what, I love pickleball. Pickleball is up and coming. Everyone's doing it for all age ranges. Mm -hmm. Why don't we bring it to our event? So, right. yeah. You know, it's interesting you brought up the, uh, the, the cooking thing and I've done that in team building exercises before. Mm -hmm. We've done the, the petting, the dog adoption thing. The fun thing about the cooking thing is for C-Event Connect, for instance, we have a bunch of event professionals who are all type A, so those things get really oh, competitive yeah. oh, after yeah. a while. Those are a lot of fun to watch, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I recommend the cooking and I recommend like, especially for local events, those puppy adoptions mm -hmm. or cats or like you said, bunnies or any kind of animal. Those are, those are huge, those yeah. do really well. Yeah, All I right. think um, we have some fun new stuff planned for Cvent Connect this year too. So if anyone on here is going, um, we're trying out some new networking things. So I don't want to give anything away All on right. this call and ruin the surprise, but um, we're really excited to try some new things and test stuff out, especially with being a new new location there here yeah. in San Antonio. And, and I do, yeah, it's great San Antonio. And, and I think the really cool thing is like a lot of people just aren't really comfortable with the traditional networking model mm -hmm. i'm not a huge fan of you know walking around to strangers and saying hi just because i'm an <laughs> introvert right so these things can really bring out people's personality and their love for certain things and i think that's a really yeah, cool it idea really can yeah i mean like you said it's hard <clears throat> to go up to somebody just you know sitting at a table or standing at a right. bar and say like strike up a conversation so yeah, it, truth it helps you speak the truth <laughs> all right so <laughs> so we got another one this is a good one all right now this might be a little tough all okay. right because we know traditionally you know, the, the, the paradigm for what makes a, 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 a post-event survey an effective one, like are you really getting what you want out of the survey? Is it just the complainers that fill out surveys or is it just, uh, you know, how, what's the, the barrier here? So the, the good question is, are post-event surveys worth it? Often the response rate is low, we know this. Mm -hmm. Respondents' feedback is often about one-off experiences. I hated the food! <laughs> or uh, why not more pickleball and goats and right. yoga? Uh, how, how do you differentiate that kind of stuff between, uh, you know, actual good, helpful feedback when you're planning an event? Because we know sometimes we focus on the worst. Mm -hmm. Even if it's yeah. the one, we focus on the worst when we should be thinking about yeah. this more holistically. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think it's a great question. I think you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. So like you said, when you send out their survey, you're typically going to get a pretty low response rate. Um, even sometimes when you provide like gift cards for completing it, you'll get a little bit higher of a response rate. And like you said, typically you're going to get more of those negative feedback in there as opposed mm -hmm. to your positive. So when you do get that positive feedback, it makes it even that much more exciting. So like I said, I think you have to take it overall with a grain of salt. I think if you overall are seeing a trend, let's just say in the food, where you see multiple survey responses that are talking about the bad food, yeah. then you know it's something that you have to think about for next event to update. If it's just one-off complaints here and there about somebody's specific experience, like, again, you kind of just take it, you look into it a little bit, see if you could alter it, see if anybody else had that problem. But um, yeah, I think it's still worthwhile to send the survey out after. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'd say still send it, but. Yeah, there's still some nuggets in there. And mm -hmm. and what do you think about, uh, so uh, you, we were talking a little bit earlier about like post-event comms. Mm -hmm. So that survey, when do you want to send that out? You should just have that loaded yeah, and ready up, to rock. Up, ready to go. Where yep. it's fresh in people's minds and they remember things, whether they're the good things or the bad things, so yep. they, that you get that feedback and you're not kind of blank on certain things, right? Yeah, so luckily with Cvent, we have a post-event um, report in our uh, registration. So as soon as the session is done, we are able to send that out, which is great. So we can do session level as well as event level mm -hmm. feedback. Um, so we try to do that almost immediately after the session and after the event, like you said, while it's fresh in people's minds right. and they're more likely, let's just say I get it while I just attended a session and I'm walking to my next one. 
it's popping up on my app asking me to do it, I'm more likely to answer those three questions and say like, yes, loved it, no, hated it, or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be while I'm on my way to my next session. So I think you're really going to be able to get those people to uh, respond quicker the right. sooner that you get it out after. So you think like, uh, so session level, you're like, bang, right after the session. Mm -hmm. And then uh, conference level, maybe when they're on the way to the airport. Yep. I'd say right. within less than 24 hours, okay. ideally. Yeah, ideally, yeah. So set those up ahead of time yep. and, and just got have it in the chamber and let it go. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, so this is an interesting question because I know that with event budgets being a challenge for so many out there, mm -hmm. you know, doing more with less, doing more with less staff, mm -hmm. uh, working with all the price increases, uh, venues and that sort of thing. We have a question here that uh, is, would you charge for any of these custom networking opportunities, goat yoga, wine tasting, et cetera, or absorb it within the budget? I know that Cvent we just kind of, it's all inclusive, right? Yep, exactly. But what would you suggest for, would you suggest doing that for a team that's like on a budget? Like, I don't know. What do you think? I think you kind of have to weigh the pros and the cons of that. Um, I think if you can, I would recommend if you could find a, a partner or a sponsor that can help you out with that. I think mm. that would be my first thing to do is um, right. let's just say the um, the goat yoga place mm. is going to be offering it. I think that's a great opportunity for you when you're booking it to reach out to them and mm. say, uh, we would love to partner with you on this, or would you be willing to sponsor this if we put your logo on the mm -hmm. yoga mats or and put your logos up on the screen and give you thank yous throughout and send people post event information with a link to your page things like that so i would recommend starting there before mm -hmm. charging your attendees for those experiences because overall they're going to want those to be included so if mm -hmm. you're charging an extra fee for them i think as an attendee i'd be less likely to do it Mm -hmm. Or I think my boss, if I'm asking for that extra money to spend to go to a goat yoga, I think she's going to say, like, I think you can skip that, right. um, you know, with our own budget. So right. I think I would first go to a sponsor or a partner and then try to absorb it into your budget, maybe try to cut somewhere else. Right. And, and you know, when you talk about sponsors, like if you're going to do something like goat yo yoga or or a rabbit rescue or petting <laughs> pets. That's a wonderful branding opportunity mm -hmm. for a company to attach themselves to because people are gonna go to that experience and they're gonna really enjoy it. Yep. And that's gonna be incredibly memorable. And if you brand that thing properly and you get the right partner in there who's got the, the right vibe and the right mindset, mm -hmm. it can be a win-win for both you and that partner yeah, that you want to exactly. work with. Yeah, exactly. They're getting their name out there more and oh, yeah. you're helping in a, their, positive, in a way. positive way. Yeah, yep. it's not like the bad fish. This right? is <laughs> this is a this is a cute puppy. Right? You should watch the survey results <laughs> after that. I'm sure they're nothing but positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good news. We have time for a couple more, Kirsten. All right. Um oh, this is a, this is kind of on the partnership uh, angle. Okay. All right. This is a little, this is in the weeds, but this is what we expect from event profs here. Okay. I find that venues don't want to partner for events unless sleeping rooms are sold with the package. How do you locate hotels willing to just hold events without selling sleeping rooms? So I think that's a great question. Um, uh, I think it's a little bit difficult. So some, mm. some are not willing to work with you and you kind of don't really have a way to work around that. Um, I think going back to that partnership and sponsorship aspect um, is really key to at least start from there. So maybe you can have your event there without the sleeping rooms, but you can say, you know, X hotel is our partner on this and they covered X, Y, Z and just really give them additional branding opportunities mm -hmm. other than saying we're having the event at X location. Um, I think that could help. Um, I don't think I've ever run into it where no event hotels would offer it without the um, sleeping rooms on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe I'm just one of the lucky ones yeah. <laughs> that's never had that. I think I'm just too pushy and annoying. And they're like, <laughs> we just want her to be quiet and stop reaching out to us. We'll give it to her. Um, but I also feel like if you share that kind of information too and say you reach out to X hotel and they say no, maybe on the next one say, hey, we reached out to someone else, but they're not willing to do it. If you let us do it without sleeping rooms, we'll sign today. Mm -hmm. So giving that extra little motivation, like even though we're not in sales, 
we all know we're kind of in sales. Like we have to sell it, we have to sell our event. And like I said, just focus on those additional potential branding opportunities that you could mm -hmm. do um, outside of just saying we're having it at X hotel. Excellent. So this is a question I, I think I'm, I'll kind of answer myself, then I'll give you a little bit. Okay. Because I want to, we, we do shout out Dara on yes, here because do. she is our, our queen marketer of event comms. I would love to see a session on event comms and strategy. Is there a webinar for that? I'm going to say I'm not sure, but you can go to cevent.com and check the resources page and just drop down. There's a whole list of webinars that are contained in there. And if there isn't, I'm making a note of this right now <laughs> because I think it's a wonderful idea. We talked about that comm strategy. So yeah. we're going to, we're definitely going to do that if we don't have it already. And she's wonderful. Um, yeah. she, she's, she's a boss. So right? I would love to have her come in and, uh, and do one for us. Um, I think we can also make a suggestion for CVent Connect this year. Maybe we can offer a session there around that. Oh, we that's a great idea. Stage. <laughs> that's a great idea. Oh yeah. Get her on stage. She's going to love that. Just spring it on her. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So this is a, this is a kind of a hearkening back to accessibility on your website. Mm -hmm. If most people are using an event website to register, how do you make sure the website is accessible to everyone? So I think that's a great question. So we're lucky enough here at Cvent that we have a whole team that handles that for us. And they go through all of the testing to make sure that our event site is accessible for um, most people, which is fantastic. But um, if you don't have that team, I think definitely focusing on that color contrast um, and you know adding in the alternative um, wording on the images and small things like that could really help. Um, I think we might actually have a, um, not a webinar, but like a blog or something on our Cvent website too that references this. Um, I'm sure we can send it out after, but um, yeah. Awesome. Um, <laughs> I want to answer this question because okay. uh, I'm new to event planning. What software is best to help plan events and keep <laughs> info organized? Oh, come on. Ooh. This has got to be a plan question. Who sent this in? Was it Karen. You, <laughs> no, I didn't know Karen sent that in. Um, are project management tools still being used? Open to attendee suggestions. So yeah, just, you know, if anybody wants to answer that question in the chat, go right ahead. Um, I know what my preference is. I won't say <laughs> it. Um, I think we might have time for, oh, let's see a couple more short ones. I'm scanning. Um, oh yeah, okay, let's see. I love personalized experiences. How do you collect the data you need to create these experiences and keep your event affordable? So I think that goes back to the question that was asked um, a little bit ago about adding in those questions to your registration. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's very helpful. Again, maybe just adding in one or two and saying that um, you're looking to really personalize the event experience. And that's the reason that you're asking so that they, they actually do want to answer it for you and they're not just skipping through the question. Um, if you do have it in your event budget to be able to offer various sessions, like maybe offering three different experiences that are tailored to different people that are running concurrently, um, I think that would be great. Again, if you don't necessarily have the budget for it, I think really leaning into those partners and sponsors um, could help you with that. Okay. Um, I think I have one final one. Um, this is this is kind of a, a more of a you know a pre-event thing. How do you help event attendees increase their buy-in for an event? We have been hosting a lot of events that get good RSVP registrations, but low attendance. I think that's a good question. Um, so I think it kind of goes back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier in that if they're coming to your event, let's just say it's a multi-day conference, they're having to skip work and push off meetings and things like that to really attend. So I think those pre-event comms, you can really if, if that's the problem, that that's why you're not having people show up, um, I would just focus on maybe adding in that working space or adding in the more time in between sessions so that they can take those meetings or, you know, take those phone calls throughout. Um, I would maybe send out some type of post-event feedback and maybe ask a creative question about, like, so sorry you weren't able to attend 
-hmm. you know, are you able to say like why you weren't able to attend and try to see if you can get a little bit more information about why they aren't. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe try, try sending out more of those pre-event comms to really like get people excited about coming. Um, but in my recommendation, I would say it's probably from the thought that people have to take off work and do all mm. these things and maybe life just gets in the way. So if you really promote that you understand that they're working individuals, you understand those potential problems, like uh -huh. you have solutions for it. Right. And, you know, and I know that we have tracks, right? So yeah. when somebody's a marketer, we're going to make sure that they're, we're not suggesting they go to event planning 101, right. Right. that their their track is tailored to them. Mm -hmm. And so that they get to see the breadth of all those sessions that they can attend that, that, yep. that impact their career. And then, and then that that's easier for them to say, boss, I have all these things I'm going to check out here. And yeah, it usually works much better to do that kind of thing yeah. than just kind of throw a whole schedule up on a website and let people peruse it. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is actually a really good tip. And I think uh, we'll close on this one. This is from Cynthia. This is really the surveys. And I don't know if everybody's watching the live Q&A, so I want to say it out loud. Uh, I've seen asking for one great thing, one not so great thing work well. Love that. Yeah. So, yeah. Love yeah, it. that's a low that's, barrier survey, right? Right. It takes somebody maybe five minutes. Right. Like maybe if they have like very detailed responses. Right. I think that's great. Hated the rubber chicken. Yeah. <laughs> love the uh, love the keynote speaker. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. Love that. So All right. I think it also depends on your management too. So mm -hmm. our management loves to ask every question because they want details and mm -hmm. like everything to be um, ranked and right results given so i think that also depends on who your leadership is but mm -hmm. if we were to able just to ask what you loved and what you didn't sounds great i yeah. think everyone would respond i think your response rate would be through the roof yeah i think so <laughs> i think you're right and i think that also goes with org size and the size of your events yes, and that sort definitely. of thing yeah you definitely. gotta uh yeah that's what's it's, it's the survey is always going to be a challenge so yeah. i think that's always going to be like one of those work in progresses yeah definitely okay well kirsten you killed it. Thank you so much <laughs> for answering all the questions. I think we're at time right now. So I want to thank uh, I want to thank everybody for their questions and for joining us today. Uh, I mean, we really enjoyed all the interaction here. This makes these so much fun. Uh, so we hope we answered your questions. Look out for the full report on cvent.com. That will be coming soon. And we wish you a happy rest of your week and good luck in planning in 2024. Thank you. Robert. I'm, I'm Robert <laughs> no, I didn't.